New Sierra Leone Ebola cases frustrate efforts to end the outbreak. The Kentucky clerk who fought gay marriage is released from jail. In a hybrid of tech cool and high fashion in Hong Kong, Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory and this is Africa 54. First today, the World Health Organization says it is possible to obtain zero Ebola cases by the end of 2015. Uh, speaking in Geneva Wednesday, WHO Assistant Director uh, General Dr. Bruce Aylward uh, said it is the World Health Organization's goal to attain zero transmission in the human population by end of 2015. However, he cautioned that governments in the region cannot be complacent and move on to other issues just because there is no new case of Ebola reported. But there must be vigilance. How do we make sure that the international community doesn't pack up and leave when we hit zero um, and that we don't have that continued capacities that are going to be needed? I think it's a real threat um, or I think I think it's a real risk, but and it's a risk that has got to be managed. I think it's fully manageable. If you've got your survivor registries, if you're screening your survivors, um, you know, it's all about helping make sure people know their status. Well, the WHO report comes as three more people have tested positive for Ebola from the same village in Sierra Leone's northern Cambia district, where a 67-year-old woman died last week from the virus. The latest outbreak temporarily dashed the country's hopes of being declared Ebola-free following the release from the hospital late last month of the country's last known Ebola patient. Sierra Leone has had nearly 14,000 cases of Ebola and about 4,000 deaths since the outbreak began in 2015. Now over to Europe. European Commission Chief Jean-Claude Juncker has called on EU member states to resettle some 160,000 refugees, saying Greece, Italy and Hungary can no longer handle the burden alone. Speaking to the European Parliament Wednesday, Juncker urged Europe to face the current refugee crisis with solidarity. He said the granting of emergency relocation in 22 member states must be done in a compulsory way to avoid delay and take the pressure off countries feeling the burden. The most affected member states are Greece, with over 200,000 refugees, Hungary, with more or less 150,000 and Italy with uh, 120,000. The numbers are impressive. For some, they are frightening. But now is not a time to take fright. It is a time for bold, determined, concerted action by the European Union, by its member states and by its institutions. The first of all the matters, before other considerations, is a matter of humanity and human dignity. And for Europe, it's also a matter for historical fairness. Well, he said Europeans should never forget why giving refuge and, co and complying with fundamental rights of asylum is so important. He is urging EU interior ministers to endorse the resettlement plan next week at a meeting of EU interior ministers. Juncker also said he believes in allowing asylum seekers to work while waiting for their asylum application to be processed. He said he expects all member states to pitch in to an emergency trust fund to address future such refugee crises. Uh, the Commission's plan calls for an expanded country by country migrant quarter plan throughout much of Europe to accept thousands of asylum seekers from the Middle East over the next two years. Under the plan, Germany, France, and Spain will take in the most, followed by Poland, the Netherlands, Romania, Belgium, and Sweden. Now, Syrian war orphans fleeing their country are usually deeply traumatized. But as a stream of refugees makes its way through Europe, some often say the death of one child could mean a better life for others. VOA's Heather Madok reports from Gaziantep, Turkey. If you ask the children at this orphanage what they want in the future, there's one consistent answer. They want to return to Syria. I will return to Syria. 
Yes, Syria. But in the meantime, caretakers say many of the children here are severely traumatized. Hyla did not want her face on camera because her family is still in Syria. It takes a long time for their minds to heal and it needs professionals. The second problem, which I think is more important, is the problem with education. The trauma is evidenced in artwork, where children draw their homes with airstrikes overhead. And some children fight the horror with a dream of an entirely new life in Europe, like the hundreds and thousands of people trying to flee there. I saw on the internet that there was a little child who drowned in the sea, and because of this boy they are going to send big boats for us. Adults say there's almost no chance Europe will send boats to fetch the people trying to enter Europe illegally. But they say the public outcry over their ordeal has awakened the world to the plight of these children and the uncertain future they face. Heather Murdoch, VOA News, Gaziantep, Turkey. Well, in Malawi, the corruption scandal known as Kashkid shocked the, inter the nation when it broke in 2013. Government officials were accused of stealing millions of dollars in public funds through a fraudulent uh, acts. A Malawian court has just sentenced their prime suspect 11 years. Several others are serving jail sentences of three to seven years. But many Malawians say they wanted to see even harsher penalties. Lamek Masinu reports from Blante, Malawi. Former ruling party official Oswald Lutepo heads to jail for 11 years on charges of conspiracy and money laundering. He is accused of siphoning about $9.3 million from government coffers, something he still denies. I'm not a thief. They used my account. Now, it depends on who is the judge here. The 37-year-old businessman is the seventh person to be jailed for involvement in the Malawi's cash kid scandal. Some Malawians think Lutepo's sentence is too lenient. We are suffering a lot in terms of hospitals, the roads, including the whole thing. Is suffering. People are in the villages, we're suffering. Education is suffering, health is suffering. So because of that issue. So if you had life sentence, I've been fair. Some say cash kid convictions don't affect high-level government officials who thrive on corruption. We need to approach that, and we can only approach that if we start punishing the key actors, not the small logs in the whole scam. Malawians see the impact of cash kid scandal in daily life. Look at how our minority sport gets the money like. Football is struggling, hockey is struggling, netball is struggling in finance. You look at 4.5 billion, what, should, what could have it done if it was being used in terms of sport? Lutebo's attorney says he may appeal the judgment. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. Well, saying to the south of the continent in hopes of empowering women, South Africa and Zimbabwe organized a cross-border trade fair last week for women operating small and medium-sized businesses. The event in Musina, South Africa, attracted more than 600 women who exhibited a wide range of products. Tusokumalo reports for VOA from Musina. It was the first time most of these women had attended a trade fair. Though most of them operate only small backyard businesses, the quality of products they displayed made some of the best found in leading stores of both South Africa and Zimbabwe. Lona Rapo, a South African entrepreneur from Rustenburg, brought her unique beads to the exhibition. She makes these from melted glass and from there can decorate anything she sets her eyes on. Very excited. Um, because uh, this, this pro project, it's, it's very interesting. It's, uh, the, the, the more you're making these, is the more you think of, of the styles, the colors, everything. Um, it's amazing. Dubbed the first of its kind, this cross-border trade fair lightly featured products the women have made with their own hands. Farm produce, cultural attire, and clothing dominated the stalls of South African women. Close to 300 Zimbabweans also crossed the border to showcase their products. Most of their stalls featured traditional foods, crafts and sculpture. With unemployment in Zimbabwe estimated by some to be above 80 percent, street vending has become the major source of income. 
many South African women have also resorted to irregular, even desperate means to make a living. This Zimbabwean minister says rules that restrict street vending must be removed. Some have not left it broken for them to grow. Because I went through it. I, I know what I'm talking about. No wonder that for these women ministers, the success of this trade fair called for a celebration. The traders themselves were just as ready to sing and dance. Tusukumalo for VOA News, Messina. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24 7 on voaafrica.com. Let's hear what you want us to feature on this show. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now, coming up, the U.S. Congress prepares to take up the Iran nuclear pact. Stay with us. news and notes. This is Living Better. Janine Lanina is about to have surgery. She's having another baby by cesarean section. She's part of a study by London's Brunel University where patients are listening to music before, during, and after surgery. Research shows that patients that do so have a lower level of pain, anxiety, and need for painkillers. Dr. Elizabeth Bell. No doctor wants to cause pain and, and so it's very nice to see that your patients are more relaxed. Lenina chose relaxing classical music for her procedure. I suppose it will be calm and slow. Lenina used general anesthesia for her past C-sections, but this time, along with some pain relief, she'll be awake listening to music through a small pillow speaker. The London researchers say it doesn't really matter what kind of music patients listen to, but it's important that it's music of their own choosing. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. Welcome back. The nuclear accord with Iran has won enough support to prevent the U.S. Congress from blocking the deal <clears throat> and possibly to pre prevent a resolution of disapproval from reaching President Barack Obama's desk. As VOA's Michael Bowman reports, more than 40 Democratic senators now back the pact, enough to keep the chamber from voting on a resolution if deal supporters unite to stop it. The Senate will come to order. Senators got back to work after a month-long recess with one issue foremost on their minds. What's at issue here is whether Iran will develop a nuclear weapon. I oppose implementation of this deal. Even the harshest Republican critics concede they lack the votes to block the accord. An initial House vote of disapproval is assured, but not so in the Senate, where the resolution might not get a final vote, making a presidential veto unnecessary. Everything of importance in the Senate requires 60 votes. So passage will require 60 votes. Democrats are demanding a three-fifths majority procedural vote to get to a final vote on the resolution. If backers of the nuclear deal negotiated between six world powers and Iran band together, they could block the resolution entirely. The pact would then go into effect without Congress fully weighing in. The Senate should not hide behind procedural obfuscation. And I call on every senator to resist attempts to obstruct a final vote and deny the American people in Congress the say they deserve on this extremely important matter. A bruising congressional vote of disapproval, even if successfully vetoed, is something the White House would rather avoid. We certainly would expect that those members of Congress who support the uh, agreement uh, to take the necessary steps in Congress to prevent uh, Congress from undermining the agreement. The determination. Whatever the outcome in Congress, Washington will continue to be a soundboard of passionate discourse on the nuclear accord with leading presidential contenders of both parties weighing in. Michael Bowman, VOA News, the Capitol. Welcome back. Now, uh, earlier on, we did mention that uh, the European uh, the e European Union is grappling with a major migrant and refugee crisis. We want to go over to Geneva now, where we have, we join up with Itai Veriri, spokes uh, rather spokesperson for the International 
organizational migration. Uh, Itai, welcome uh, to Africa 54. Uh, thank you, Vincent. Yes, uh, one of the things that appears to be uh, coming out of this crisis is funding. Tell us a little bit how uh, this uh, is challenging those who are trying to help all these refugees and migrants in Europe. Well, as we already know, I mean, the numbers are quite unprecedented, in, certainly in terms of uh, those numbers that are arriving in uh, Italy and Greece. So therefore, I mean, the European Union has uh, started recognizing that more needs to be done in terms of actually providing the resources that are needed to look after uh, the migrants who are arriving. And, and as I said, the bulk are arriving in those two states. Today, what um, European Commission President uh, Jean-Claude Juncker has actually announced is, uh, apart from what he calls a swift and determine, uh, determined uh, comprehensive response, they're also putting aside some actual resources, like in terms of uh, funding, to actually assist countries that are, uh, are facing uh, this emergency directly. In the same vein, I mean, we're also seeing a situation where um, some of the uh, systems that are currently existing in Europe, whether it had to do with uh, protection for international refugees or just migration, you know, like uh, migration checks like Dublin II are not working. So they need to actually go back to that and see whether they have enough resources to have the systems actually operational and fit for purpose. And I think that's what we are going to see more of uh, coming out of the meeting on the 14th when the uh, European Commission and, and the various countries meet. Now, we know that uh, there are various international organizations, aid organizations that have been working on the ground in so many of those countries. Uh, how is the situation with their funding, their particular funding? It's, it's, as, as you can imagine, we are looking at, at a situation globally where uh, a lot of um, uh, funding calls are currently in existence. So we're looking at the situation in Syria, we're looking at the situation in Iraq, we're looking at the situation in Yemen, amongst many other countries, and of course Libya. So already the resources that are there are already stretched. And this is another additional emergency that we're dealing with, and quite a lot of agencies, including ourselves, are certainly uh, struggling in terms of providing support uh, to the migrants and refugees who we are seeing on our screens every day. And certainly the call has gone out for more resources, and I think the European Commission is um, uh, hopefully heeding that uh, call for more resources, and they will be provided. So far, some of the funding that has been provided has been sent directly to the countries that are directly affected, like Greece, Italy, and Hungary lately. But yes, I, I, I think certainly more is needed to, 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 to support these desperate people, especially when you see pictures of children mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, desperately clinging to their parents. Now, Those children you know, have to be fed, have to be clothed, and we need that kind of support. Now, it's high. There's been a lot of debate over refugee uh, versus a migrant at this point does it really matter well at this point I mean we're talking about human beings yes the definitions matter when it when it comes to especially a jurisdiction like uh, the European Union where they have uh, their own rules on migration and asylum but when we are talking about human beings I think the first and foremost is to ensure that they are safe that they are treated as humanely as possible and then I mean the reality is that sometimes when you delve into semantics, you forget about the actual human beings that we're trying to assist. And also when you talk of refugees, refugees are a subsection of, of, of migrants, and refugees is a specific definition uh, under international conventions. So we would certainly um, not really want to get bogged down into all the issue about definitions, but focus more on the actual people that need help. Well, Itai, thank you very much. Itai Vereri is a spokesman for the international organization of migration and joined us via phone from Geneva. Here in the United States, a Kentucky County clerk has been released from jail after being detained for contempt over her refusal to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Kim Davis' decision not to issue the licenses, which came about two months after the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark ruling legalizing gay marriage across the country, has inflamed passion on both sides of the debate. A viewer is Mike Richman reports. Kim Davis walked out of a detention center in Grayson, Kentucky Tuesday, six days after being jailed for refusing to issue marriage licenses to gay couples. A federal judge ruled she could be released because five of her six deputy clerks stated under oath they would comply with the court's order 
and issue marriage certificates to all legally eligible couples. The judge ordered Davis not to interfere with the granting of same-sex marriage licenses. Davis, fighting back tears, addressed a cheering crowd while standing next to Republican presidential candidate Mike Huckabee, her lawyer Matt Staver, and her husband Joe. Thank you all so much. I love you all so very much. I just want to give God the glory. He is, his people have rallied and you are a strong people. Davis, an apostolic Christian, argued that authorizing gay marriages would violate her religious beliefs. Staber said she was simply upholding her faith and should not have spent time in prison. You know, Kim stood up for her beliefs and for the law. In Kentucky, if you issue a license that's not authorized by statute, it is a criminal violation. And that statute has not been changed by the General Assembly in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Huckabee, a Baptist minister and former Arkansas governor, denounced the Supreme Court decision in June legalizing gay marriage. The court ruled five to four in the case. And we do not want to see this country become the smoldering remains of what once was a great republic where the people ruled and it's exchanged for a place where five unelected lawyers think that they can rule. We're here to say, no, they cannot. While Davis was in jail, deputy clerks from her county issued marriage licenses to several same-sex couples. Mike Richmond, VOA News, Washington. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, a closer look at one of the hottest tech trends, hybrid smart watches. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. A slowdown in the Chinese economy affects African commerce and infrastructure projects funded by Beijing. In Ivory Coast, the first presidential election since 2010 unites the city's population to celebrate with a music and food festival. In Senegal, prosecutors vividly detail the torture methods used by ex-dictator Hisena Bre. In Rwanda, the Supreme Court is to hear challenge by the main opposition party to moves allowing President Paul Kagame a third term. In Egypt, a women-only taxi service, Pink Taxi, aims to provide safe mode of transportation in a country with high sexual harassment rates. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending in Hong Kong. The flavor of the timekeeping season, but with a different feel. It is no longer just about the glittery diamonds, the glossy gold, or even a classic Hello Kitty. The latest radio smartwatch hybrids. One flashes when your mobile rings and displays your text messages. Another has all the hallmarks of a traditional wristwatch, but it also lets you run Bluetooth. Where Abotech is taking up a growing slice of the global watch market with millions of smart watches sold this year alone. New types are being tested out all the time. If the spotty feel isn't your thing, maybe a smaller, more glamorous device would be better suit would better suit your style. And next up, exotic edibles from the food trend fair in London. This beer salami comes from Transylvania and is seasoned with juniper berries paprika, nutmeg, and garlic. Another show feature is Green Lady, which boasts the claim of being the first British sparkling tea. Creator Francis Oyewole gave up his career as a budding corporate lawyer when he struck upon the idea of a tea champagne. Other offerings include beetroot ketchup with beetroot and apple, replacing tomatoes in the sauce, as well as strawberry and cream-flavored popcorn. Hmm, bon appetit. And finally, as quickly as trends come and go, the landscape of Fashion Week in New York is changing. After roughly six years, Mercedes-Benz is out as lead sponsor, and the week has been rebranded as New York Fashion Week. The shows, and after five years at Lincoln Center, the shows will now be held at three different locations throughout Manhattan, in addition to some designers' off-site venues. Harper's 
Bazaar.com will launch its Snapchat profile on the first day of shows as a way to instantly deliver the latest news to fashion fans. And that's what's trending today, Vincent. Well, thanks a lot, Esther. Now, the Children's Science Center Lab is a place for kids to experiment, design and build things. As Faiz El Masri tells us, the exhibits are designed to help kids ages 2 to 12 explore science, technology, engineering and mathematics concepts. Faith Lapidus narrates. We need to pour off the excess water. Ew! We'll start at the experiment bar, where Hope, her brother and mother are busy with slime. We did lots of fun things. We did fun experiments like Mag this magnet goo. Oh, there, it's starting to look like a ball. It's been a new museum going experience for them. It feels so weird. We've taken them to lots of different museums where they just look, but this one they get to touch. What makes the Children's Science Center different from other museums is that parents may experiment along with their kids. Family learning is so powerful, and when you have an experience learning as a child with someone in your family, those can be some of the most formative learning experiences that you have. And there are lots of experiences to be had. The Discovery Zone is for younger children, age five and under. Older kids like the Inspiration Hub. Whee! Whee! In the wind tube, kids learn how flowing air creates aerodynamic effects that aircraft engineers try to optimize. And here at the Tinker Shop, they're building their own creations. And it will walk around and draw with the legs as markers. So there's not really a hologram in there, is there? And no matter where visitors go, they'll always find a helping hand. I'm mostly there to like help if they have questions or if they get stuck on something. But it's always nice as a parent to know that somebody else is there to assist us and just sort of, you know, encourage them to try it a different way or, um, you know, give it another chance before moving on to another experiment. The Earth is one giant magnet, just like this. Since opening two months ago, the Children's Science Center has attracted more than 10,000 visitors. There's no secret to its popularity. It's learning mixed with fun. The goo is coming out. For writer Faiza El Masri, I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words, where we teach you about words in the news. You might have heard this word in a story about international trade. Burmese officials say new investments help support political reforms, but U.S. officials could tighten sanctions again if those reforms do not continue. Sanctions. This means one or more countries have stopped or limited trade with another nation. It often is because the country being sanctioned is not obeying international law. Sanctions also can include limiting economic aid to a country. Now, when you hear the word sanctions, your English will be good enough to know what it means. For more news words, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com.